Hey everyone, in this lesson we're talking about the condition known as diverticulitis. In this lesson we're going to talk about what this condition is, risk factors, signs and symptoms of this condition. We're also going to talk about how we diagnose and treat it and what are some of the complications of diverticulitis. So to begin, we're going to break down the word diverticulitis. Diverticulitis, diverticule and itis simply means a condition due to inflammation of a diverticula. The prefix diverticula stands for diverticula and the suffix itis means inflammation. And this differs from the word diverticulosis. You might have heard of this condition. Diverticul Diverticulosis means an abnormal condition of having diverticula. So these are not the same condition. If a person has diverticula, they have diverticulosis. If those diverticula become inflamed, they have diverticulitis. So what are diverticula and what is diverticulitis more specifically? So diverticula are sac-like outpouchings of the large intestine. So you can see right here in this image, here's the large intestine. And here are these little outpouchings, these little bulges in the large intestine. These are diverticula. So having these simply means you have diverticulosis. If these become inflamed for whatever reason, then you have diverticulitis. So the presence of diverticula again is known as the condition of diverticulosis. And diverticulitis is inflammation of a diverticulum due to a microperforation generally speaking. Oftentimes what happens is there is a fecolith or a small piece of feces that essentially blocks or gets lodged in one of the diverticula causing inflammation. So that is generally what causes diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is one of several diverticular diseases. So there are several diverticular diseases. Diverticulitis is just one of them. So others include symptomatic uncomplicated diverticular disease. It can present similarly to diverticulitis, but it often is only transient. It doesn't last very long. So they can have some lower abdominal pain that only occurs briefly and doesn't have other associated issues. And there's also a condition known as diverticular hemorrhage where there are little vessels that are associated with the diverticula that can actually break and cause bleeding and people can see hematochesia or blood in their stool. Now the etiology of diverticulitis is due to the development of diverticula as we mentioned before in the large intestine and the development of these diverticula is due to increased colonic pressure and decreased bowel compliance. We're going to talk a bit more about this in the next slide. And 10 to 25 percent of patients with diverticulosis will develop diverticulitis. So what are some of the risk factors of diverticulitis. Some of the risk factors include increasing age. This may actually be the most important risk factor. You can imagine that as we age, bowel compliance can decrease and other risk factors can accumulate over time. So generally speaking, 60 years and older is when you're going to see diverticulitis. It's very uncommon in individuals less than 40 years of age. And again, as we mentioned before, as we age, our bowels become less compliant. The second risk factor is decreased fiber intake. This is also a very important risk factor. With individuals that have a very low fiber diet, they generally have increased constipation. And over the course of an individual's life, if they've had decreased fiber intake, they can have chronic constipation. Chronic constipation can lead to increased colonic pressure and the increased colonic pressure can lead to a less compliant bowel with essentially these diverticula popping out in areas of weakness in the bowel wall. So again, over time, the bowel wall becomes weaker just because of that increased colonic pressure and eventually an area in the bowel wall can blow out forming a diverticula. Another risk factor is a high red meat intake along with high fat diet intake. Another risk factor is lack of vigorous physical activity. Smoking can also be a risk factor for diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Another risk factor is high body mass index and another one is non anti-inflammatory or NSAID use. And generally this is a chronic use. So all of these risk factors can increase the risk for developing diverticulosis and diverticulitis. So if we can manage these risk factors, we can decrease the risk of having recurrent diverticulitis. Now you might've heard of the idea that eating nuts, corn, and seeds can worsen diverticular diseases. But I just wanna point out that there's not a very significant evidence to show that. Generally speaking, nuts, corn, and seeds do not appear to be associated with an increased risk of diverticulosis diverticulitis or diverticular bleeding. So I wanted to mention that here. Now, before we move on, I want to talk about some definitions with regards to diverticulitis. So a true diverticula is a outpouching of all three layers of the colon, mucosa, submucosa, and muscular layer. Whereas a pseudo diverticula or a false diverticula only has the two layers, mucosa and submucosa that outpouches through the muscle. There's also what we call simple or uncomplicated diverticulitis. This is an acute diverticulitis 
diverticulitis without an associated complication. I'm going to mention what these complications are in a moment. And a complicated diverticulitis is essentially acute diverticulitis with a complication. So these complications can be bowel obstruction, perforation, fistula, and or abscess. So we're going to talk about more about these complications a little later as well. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of diverticulitis? One of the cardinal symptoms of diverticulitis is abdominal pain, and it is a constant pain that generally occurs in the left lower quadrant. This is the most common location of abdominal pain, especially in Western countries with Western diets. So again, here's the left side of the patient. If we're looking straight on a patient, here's the left side. Right in the left lower quadrant is where the majority of individuals are going to have pain. This is different in other populations. Right lower quadrant pain, so pain in this area or suprapubic pain in this area can occur in Asian populations. So you can see this in Asia where diverticulitis can be more associated with right lower quadrant pain or suprapubic pain. With regards to the right lower quadrant pain or, or the suprapubic pain, you want to suspect diverticulitis when the pain is lasting longer than three days because generally we think about diverticulitis when we have the pain in the left lower quadrant. The pain can be diffuse, so it might not be necessarily localized to one area or the other. It could be diffusely throughout the entire abdomen. There is also associated gastrointestinal symptoms as well. So we've got the abdominal pain, but there's also other associated symptoms. Some of these can include nausea and vomiting. When you see nausea and vomiting with diverticulitis, you want to worry about obstruction. So you want to worry about that one of the diverticula have become inflamed so much that they can cause obstruction of the large intestine. Other associated gastrointestinal symptoms include alterations in bowel habit. These include constipation and or diarrhea. So you, you can see issues with bowel movements along with the abdominal pain. Other signs and symptoms include urinary frequency, urgency, and dysuria. You might be thinking, why does this happen? Well, if we can see a picture here, if we have a sigmoid colon here, the bladder here, if you have a diverticula that becomes very inflamed in the sigmoid colon, the inflamed diverticula can actually push against the bladder. And when it pushes against the bladder, it's going to make the person feel like they need to urinate. So they're going to have urinary frequency, urgency, and it can even cause some burning sensation as well. And because there might be some microperforation, there might be some fecal matter exiting through the diverticula, they can become febrile and tachycardic. The complications of diverticulitis occur in approximately 15% of acute diverticulitis patients. These again include perforation, generally with peritonitis, an abscess forming. So if you think you've got a perforation of one of those diverticula, they are a weakened wall. They're not as strong as the surrounding bowel wall. So they can be weak and they can essentially pop a hole in them, leading to fecal matter exiting and causing a potential abscess to form. A fistula. So fistula is an epithelialized tract between one epithelial layer and another. And what happens is in this picture, if a diverticula in the sigmoid colon is inflamed and pushing against the bladder, the inflamed diverticula can lead to a fistula forming between the sigmoid colon and the bladder. And in fact, the bladder is a common site for a fistula to form. So fistula, again, is a tract between the colon and the bladder. It can happen in other areas as well. You might have a fistula between the colon and the skin or colon in other areas areas as well. But uh, generally speaking, the bladder is commonly involved. So again, the fistula can connect the large intestine to the bladder. And as I mentioned before, sometimes a diverticulate becomes so inflamed, it can lead to obstruction of the large intestine. How do we make the diagnosis of diverticulitis? The diagnosis of diverticulitis is suspected when we see those characteristic abdominal pain and tenderness. So left lower quadrant pain, they're very tender in that area. They have constant pain with associated changes in bowel habits and they might be febrile and tachycardic, we're going to think about diverticulitis. If you were to do blood work, you might also see leukocytosis, so an increase in the white blood cell count. But what I really want you to take away from this is that doing a CT scan with IV contrast is required to confirm the diagnosis of acute diverticulitis. And this is also required to ensure there are no other complications we talked about before. So if you do a CT scan, you can see the diverticula in the large intestine. And doing a colonoscopy is not recommended in diverticulitis just because of the weakened inflamed wall of the diverticula but if you were to look inside you would see a pattern like this so you can see all these outpouchings here of the diverticula. Once we make the diagnosis of diverticulitis we need to determine the severity
severity of the diverticulitis. This helps us determine if we need to treat them in hospital or as an outpatient. So the severity is generally broken down into a couple of categories, either uncomplicated or complicated, and then that's further broken down into inpatient versus outpatient. So as I mentioned before, complicated diverticulitis is an acute diverticulitis that has any of the complications like perforation, abscess, obstruction, or a fistula. Any of these, if we see any of these on a CT scan, this is inpatient treatment. So we admit the patient and we treat them in hospital. If the patient doesn't have any of these complications, they have uncomplicated diverticulitis, but if they have any of these other list of conditions, if they have sepsis, micro perforation or a phlegmon, if they're an immunosuppressed patient, for whatever reason, they might have a poorly controlled diabetes, they use uh, steroids chronically, or they're on some kind of immunosuppressive treatment, or they have HIV or AIDS, or if they have a fever that's very high, generally greater than 102.5 Fahrenheit or 39 Celsius, or if they have very significant leukocytosis, or if they're very old, greater than 70, or if they're intolerant of oral intake, or they have severe abdominal pain or peritonitis, or they have failed outpatient treatment. So if they have any of these plus the uncomplicated diverticulitis, we also want to treat these patients in hospital as well. So again, very big list, but just think about if they're uncomplicated diverticulitis, if they have anything else, any other worrisome factors, treat them in the hospital. If they have complicated diverticulitis, they're treated in hospital automatically. So if they have uncomplicated diverticulitis without any of these other associated issues or worries, then we can treat them as an outpatient. So how do we treat them? As an outpatient, if they have uncomplicated diverticulitis without any of those other big list of concerns, we can treat them as an outpatient. Oral antibiotics for seven to 10 days. There's a, several options for oral antibiotics. You can use ciprofloxacin and metronidazole, levofloxacin and metronidazole, or amoxicillin clavulinate and we put them on a specialized diet. So we generally can put them on two to three days of a liquid diet, liquid diet only. Then we can reassess. If they're getting better, then we can liberalize their diet. So we can make the diet soft and then slowly increase it to a regular diet. If they're inpatient, it's a bit different. We start them on IV antibiotics until they're stabilized. And when what I mean by stabilized is that I mean there's a resolution of their abdominal pain and tenderness. You can put them on IV fluids and pain control as well because you generally want them MPO. So nothing by mouth. They don't eat or drink anything. Depending on the severity, if they're not very, very severe, or if they're not too bad, we might be able to put them on a liquid diet. But generally, we put them on MPO with IV fluids and IV antibiotics. If a patient has any of the complications, we need a few extra steps. If they have an abscess, if it's large enough, we might be able to use a percutaneous drain. So we can have essentially a drain that is sucking out that abscess, or we can just put them on IV antibiotics to deal with the abscess. If there's a microperforation, it's just generally IV antibiotics. If it's an obstruction, we need surgical resection. And if it's a fistula, we also need a surgical resection as well. So once we've treated the patient, there are several considerations later on after. After recovery, we want to start the patient on a low fiber diet and then slowly increase their fiber intake. There is a risk for recurrence. It's generally 20 to 50% have recurrent episodes of diverticulitis. So if the patient was on a conservative therapy, if they were only treated by diet and oral antibiotics, 30% of them remain asymptomatic. And there are other associated issues as well. As much as 20% of patients can have chronic abdominal pain. So even after the diverticulitis has resolved, 20% of them can have chronic abdominal pain. And a lot of times this can be mistaken for or attributed to irritable bowel syndrome. So it can appear like an irritable bowel syndrome. And I also want to mention here that a hemicolectomy, so a partial removal of the large intestine can be undertaken to remove the troublesome portion of the large intestine that contains the diverticula. If the patient has frequent recurrences of diverticulitis or they never fully resolve if they have been treated in patient, their pain never goes away, they're still febrile, they still have leukocytosis, the surgery can then be considered. So I wanted to mention that here. I didn't talk about it specifically, but there is a time when surgery can be undertaken if there are recurrent episodes of diverticulitis or if a episode of diverticulitis doesn't resolve. So if you want to learn more about other medical conditions, please check out my channel. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel as well. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.